Well, good morning to students of class 11 science. Welcome to biology class. Today we'll begin with a new chapter, chapter number 4, Animal Kingdom. So in the previous classes we have learned about the plant kingdom, their classifications, their different classes along with their characters. So today we are going to look into the animal kingdoms, okay, their particular classification process on what basis they have been classified and what are the different classes or the phylums of animal kingdom. In class one also we have learned about the different phylums of animal kingdom like let's say phylum Porifera, Nidaria, Tenophora, okay, Echinodermata, Arthropoda. So on what basis are they classified? Okay, are the animals classified into different different phylums that we are going to learn in today's class? So first of all today we learn about the basis of classifying of animal kingdom. So mainly animals they are mainly heterotrophs because they are not able to synthesize their own food particles. Okay, they are dependent directly or indirectly on the autotrophs, that is the green plants. And we have got the holozoic mode of nutrition where we used to ingest the food particles and that food particles will be digested, will be absorbed and will be assimilated and finally excreted. So let's check out the levels of organization's first class basis of classification. Okay, remember that we are going to learn about the basis of classification of animal kingdom so on what basis the animals are classified into different different phylums okay so the first basis is level of organization so remember each and every organism is made up of cells clear and a group of cells having the same functions they will form a tissue and the tissue will form an organ and finally we have got the organ system level so similarly in levels of organization also we have got three levels one is cellular level then we have got tissue level and we have got the organ system level clear so cellular level means where each and every body functions is mainly done by a single cells and it is mainly seen in case of sponges the phylum porifera okay so mainly in case of sponges the bodily functions is carried out by our cells though they are multicellular they are composed of multiple cells but over there in case sponges in case porifers, the cells they will not form the tissues so only the cells will carry out the function so they have got the cellular level of organizations clear then we have got the second level which is called the tissue level of organizations where the group of cells having the similar functions they will form a tissue and it is mainly found in Ceylonterata and you can say in Hydra okay so they have got the tissue level of organizations where the cells are specialized and they are mainly been designed in such a way that they can perform the different functions by forming a tissues then we have got the organ system level of organizations where the tissues will form a particular organs and this is mainly been shown by the members of the phylum platyhelminthes and up to the other higher phyla okay so in these animals the tissues are grouped to form the organs and each organ is capable of performing a specific particular functions so remember we have got three levels of organizations one is cellular level we seen in the phylum poriferans sponges then we have got tissue level of organizations which is found in cellulonterates or cellulonterata then we have got the organ system level of organization which is seen from the members of the phylum platyhelminthes to the higher phyla okay then number two we have got the body plan so you, you just remember the body plan only we have got the cell aggregate plan which is seen in case of sponges we have got the blind sac plan which is seen in the phylum cilantroids and the fat worms we have got the tube within the tube plan which is seen in the members of other group phylums okay now why i'm teaching this is that though this has been removed from the syllabus but this is the basic idea about the classification of living organisms mainly the animals okay it is the basic knowledge that we must have because once we go through this basis of classification of animal kingdom once we go through the terms and terminologies of classification and it will be easier for us to go through the characteristics of each and every phylum that's why i'm teaching you from the basis of animal classification so that each and every term will be clear for you and will be easier for you when we go through the phylums of animal classification clear then the next one is body symmetry the body symmetry means the arrangement of similar body parts on the two sides of main axis of the body of an organism that means when we will divide the body into two equal halves each half must contain the similar body parts in equal 
okay and that's called symmetry and on the basis of body symmetry we have got two types that animals are divided in two types one is called asymmetrical and number two is called symmetrical asymmetrical animals means the animals of those body which cannot be divided into two equal halves really those animals like the body of those animals which cannot be divided into two equal parts they are called asymmetrical animals and the examples are amoeba sponges the snails whenever we will try to cut their body into two equal halves their body cannot be divided equally into the two parts so those animals are called asymmetrical animals next one is symmetrical animals and remember in biology the word a means no n or no okay so they are not divided into two equal parts now let's come to symmetrical animals where the body parts are so arranged that their body can be cut into two similar halves in one or more planes so in case of symmetrical animals the body plan can be divided into two equal halves in wind directions or in more than one direction or plane okay so that's why we have got three types of symmetry under the symmetrical animals one is called spherical symmetrical then we have got radial symmetrical okay so let's go first to the spherical symmetrical where their body parts are arranged as spare in radial symmetry the body can be divided into two equal halves from any number of planes from any directions we can divide the body into two equal halves in case of radial symmetry so on radial symmetry we have got biradial symmetry where the body can be divided into two equal halves by one or two particle planes then we have got tetrameric symmetry okay we have got pentameric symmetry and we have got hexameric symmetry but over here you have to remember what does biradial symmetry means that is very, very important okay and then next one number three is bilateral symmetrical where the body can be divided into two equal halves from only one plane remember the difference when the body can be divided into two equal halves from any plane that is called radial symmetry but when the body can be divided into two equal halves from only one plane that is called bilateral symmetry clear please keep in your mind Okay, so here you can see the figure that figure A is sponges which is all symmetrical animals the body cannot be divided into two equal halves from any plane or from any directions the number B you can see the spherical symmetrical animals and C you can see the radial symmetrical animals and D is the bilateral symmetrical animals from where we can cut the body into two equal halves from only one plane but look at this C the body can be divided into any like from any plane it can be divided into two equal halves clear now next basis of animal classification comes to diploblastic and triploblastic organization and for this kind remember the embryonic germ layer cells during embryonic development of a fetus we have got three embryonic germ layer cells and those germ layer cells are ectoderm mesoderm and the endoderm clear this particular germ layer cells will give rise to different tissues and organs in our body during embryonic development ectoderm endoderm and mesoderm all right so diploblastic and triploblastic organizations means they are classified according to the presence of three embryonic germ layer cells if only the two germ layer cells ectoderm and endoderm are present then they are called diploblastic in such animals the ectoderm and the endoderm they are separated by the help of mesoglial cells okay so diploblastic animals means those animals who have got ectoderm that's outer ectoderm and the inner endoderm and this ectoderm and the endoderm they are separated by the mesoglia and this is exhibited by the animals of the phylum Coelenterata if all the three immunic germ layer cells ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm are present then they are called triploblastic animals and they are present from the phylum platyhelminthes to the phylum codata the higher phylum okay then third one is Cilum, the body cavity, the fruitful space between the body wall and the gut is called the body cavity or we call it cilum. okay and always the cilums are lined with the mesoderm cilum if they are present then always they have to land with the mesoderm then only they are called the true body cavity or the true cilum. okay so based on the presence or the absence of the cilum, we have got cilumate animal we have got pseudo cilumate animal and we have got the all cilumate animal cilumate means animals which possess a true cilum or the true body cavity and those cilums are lined by the mesoderm it's mainly shown in the phylum any leads any kind of dogs okay then we will come to the pseudo silhouette animals pseudo means false remember the meaning of pseudo silhouette the word pseudo means false silhouette means presence of silhouette though over here the silhouette is present 
but it's not lined by mesoderm. I'm telling you one more time, if the true body cavity coelom is present, then it has to line by the mesoderm, which is only seen in case of coelom and animals. But in pseudo coelom and animals, coelom is there, body cavity is there, but it is not lined by the mesoderm. But over here, the mesoderms are occurred as a scattered pouches. Look at the figure number B, it's in the form of a pouches, which is called the mesodermal pouches. Okay, and it's shown and mainly contains the ectoderm and the endoderm and is present from the phylum uh, list from S. C. Helminthes. Then we have got all coelom and animals. A means no, they don't have body cavity or the coelom. Body cavity or coelom is absent in case of all coelom and animals and is seen in the phylum Platyhelminthes. Clear? This is the fifth basis of classification of animal kingdom. Then we go to the next basis, which is called. Uh, sorry, before that, we'll go into the function of coelom, function of body cavity. This coelom, it act is the protective membrane. Okay, it protects from the mechanical shocks or from the injuries. So coelom act as the shock absorber and protect the internal organs from the external shock. It is an site for the maturation of gamete also. It allows the temporary storage of waste materials also. Okay, It allows the gut to move independently on the body wall. So it provides the space where the body organs remain suspended. So these are the few functions of the body cavity or the function of coelom. The next one we go through the segmentations. Uh, like segmentation means you have seen the earthworm. In the body of the earthworm, we have seen the presence of multiple ring-like structures from the anterior region to the posterior region that is called segmentation okay so segmentation means the linear sequence of a series of short cylindrical units we call these segments and since these segments are repeated multiple times it is also called metamerisms do we call it metamers it is also called metamerisms where the segments are repeated all over the body of a species clear then uh, like this particular segmentation you will see from the phylum Annelida, uh, you will see in the phylum Orthopoda and in case of Codata also. So they used to create multiple segments in their body. Okay. Then next one we will go into uh, appendages, directly in point number 8 appendages, uh, we means the presence of legs, foot or city. Okay, that is mainly used in the process of locomotions and in the process of food capture. Okay, so these are the parts that mainly projects are from the main axis of the body and this will help in the process of locomotions to move from one place to another place and also help in the capture of food particles also. So, uh, this particular appendages, it can be in the form of tentacles in sea animals or in the form of setae in case of uh, paraporia, so, sorry, uh, setae and paraporia in case of annelida, it can be in the form of antennae and legs in case of orthopoda fins in case of fishes, uh, legs and wings in case of vertebrates, okay, so these are the few examples of appendages which can occur in different forms because they are helping in locomotions and they are also helping to capture the food particles. The next basis we will go through notochord, this is the most important one, okay, so notochord means the solid rod like structures which are present on the dorsal side during the embryonic development. So animals who possess notochord, they are called chordates, okay. And those who do not put a notochord, they are called non chordates Even we used to have notochord during our embryonic development, but later on they are replaced by the vertebral column. Clear? The next one goes to digest systems. So we have got complete and incomplete digest systems, which will help in the digestion of food particles. Incomplete means where there is single opening. Only single opening is there from where the food particle will be ingested and will be excreted. And is seen in Ceylonterats and Platyhelminthes. Complete means there are two openings. Okay, one for the entry of food particles, for the ingestion of food particles and second opening is there for the removal of waste materials. So, where there will be presence of both openings, okay, where will the opening is two openings, then that is called complete digestive system. So, with single opening, we will call it incomplete digestive systems. So, where there will be, uh, like where the single openings will function both for the ingestions and for the excretion of food particles, but in complete digestive systems, we will find the two openings, okay. What is called the mouth at the anterior end and the anus at the posterior end. So mouth mainly to engulf the food particles and anus for the removal of waste particles. Then we have got respiratory systems which mainly help in our like school in the process of respirations. Clear that you know that this system will help in the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the surrounding environment and the body cells. So we have got different mode of respiration. Uh, we have got aerial mode of respirations which is found in the terrestrial animals. Okay, uh, then uh, those animals that put aerial motor respirations, they have got trachea, they have got lungs, uh, the respiratory organs. Then we have got 
the aquatic respiration also for those animals which respire in water okay it's mainly seen in the phylum cylindrata sponges annelids and crustaceans uh, they used to obtain the oxygen which is dissolved in the water then we'll talk about the next basis which is called the circulatory systems which will help in the circulations of uh, materials inside the body so we have got two types of circulatory systems closed and open closed means where we have got three types of blood vessels artery veins and capillary the blood will flow through the artery the blood will flow through the veins and they will finally enter into the capillary so these are called closed circulatory systems where in closed systems the blood will not bath the body organs clear and is mainly found in annelida echinoderms and all the body bits. but in case of open circulatory systems the capillaries are absent so the blood vessels okay the artery will open directly into the wider species called the sinuses and the body organs are completely bathed by the blood so it's mainly seen in the orthopods and the mollusk so in closed systems we will find artery vein and capillary so the blood will flow through the artery the blood will flow through the vein and through the capillaries okay but in case of open systems we don't find capillary they are absent and the blood vessel that is mainly the artery the blood will flow through the eat and will open into the wider spaces which are called the sinuses and they will bath the body organs clear then next comes the excretory systems which will help in the removal of nitrogenous waste products from the body it will help in the removal of waste substances okay so it mainly helps in the removal of nitrogenous waste substances and it will help in the maintenance of homeostasis of the body it will help in maintaining the water and the soil balance in the body so depending upon the types of waste materials we have got different types of animals depending on the types of nitrogenous waste they used to excrete so first one is amenotelic where they to excrete ammonia and is found in protozoans, sponges, nidarians, tapworm and annelids. Then the second one is uro ureotelic where they to excrete urea and is found in cartilaginous fishes like shark, amphibians, reptiles and mammals. Then third one is urecotelic where they used to excrete uric acid and found in the insects okay mp uh, like reptiles birds and uh, land snails and some crustaceans. Then we have got aminotelic which excrete Excess of amino acids is found in Hunio, okay, Limnia, and Staphys. Then we have got the fifth one, which is called Guanotelic, which is excretes guanine, and it's mainly seen in case of spider. So, depending on the type of waste products which are being excreted, the types of natinous waste products which are excreted, we have got Aminotelic, Ureotelic, uh, then Urecotelic, Aminotelic, and Guanotelic. Okay, then we will come to the uh, 16 point of reproductions, uh, which mainly help in the production of offsprings. So here in case of sexual mode reproduction, so we have got the gametes, gametes are haploid. So we have got the male gametes which are called sperm and we have got the female gamete which are called the ova. The male gametes are microscopic, they are flagellated and they are motile, they are able to move. Okay. Whereas the female gametes, uh, they are non-motile, they are large spiracles and they are not able to move. The testes produces the sperms and the ovaries they will produce the ova okay then we'll go into the external fertilization and the internal fertilization fertilization means the fusion of male gamete and the female gamete that is the fusion of sperm and the ova so we have got two types of fertilization external fertilization and the internal fertilization external fertilization means where the female will lay the egg in the surrounding medium this for example in case of amphibians the amphibians used to lay the egg in the water body clear so in external fertilizations the female gamete and the male gamete has to be released simultaneously in the external medium let's say in water simultaneously to, in order to bring fertilization so female will deposit the egg they will lay the egg and male will release the sperm in the water body to bring fertilization so here in external fertilization fertilization is occurring outside the body so it is called external fertilization but in internal fertilization the fertilization takes place within the body of the female okay so mainly in internal fertilization it occurs in the general tract of the female body okay and here the male will deposit the sperm in the female genital tract during copulation or during sexual intercourse so since fertilization occurs inside the body of the female it is called internal fertilization and when we talk about the advantages between the these two then obviously the internal fertilization has more advantage than the external fertilization because in the external fertilizations 
the eggs can be preyed upon by the predator or even after hatching the larvae or the adults will also be preyed by the predator so there is less chances of survival of offsprings but when we talk about the internal fertilization since it occurs inside the body of the female so there is complete protections given by the mother to the offspring Okay, so there is more chances of survival in case of internal fertilization is compared to external fertilization. Clear? The next one we will talk about the body temperature. Body temperatures means our constant body temperature is 37 degree Celsius. Okay, so depending on the body temperatures, we have got poikilothermic animals and we have got homeothermal animals. Poikilothermal animals are also called ectothermal animals or cold blooded animals because these animals are not able to maintain their constant body temperature when the environment temperature keeps on changing. So since they are not able to maintain their body temperature depending upon the environmental conditions, so they are called poikilothermic or cold blooded or ectothermal animals. Example fishes, amphibians are cold blooded animals. And when we come into the homeothermal animals or endothermal animals or warm blood animals, we are the one who are able to maintain the constant body temperature and our body temperature does not change with the change in the environmental temperature. Clear? So we are warm blood animals, we are able to maintain our constant body temperature and our body temperature does not change with the changing environmental temperature. Okay. And in order to protect themselves against the low and very high temperature, the cold blood animals have developed a few processes in order to escape those adverse climatic conditions. One is called hibernation, the long winter sleep. Okay. The cold blood animals hide themselves to escape from the low temperature like the lizard, snake, frog. Okay. And estivation means the summer sleep. The cold blood animals hide themselves in some shady area during the extreme summer conditions. So these are the two processes by which the cold blood animals tends to maintain the body temperatures and they will try to escape the adverse environmental conditions. Though in warm blood animals also we can find the process of hibernation in the polar bear like the where they used to go for the long winter sleep. So here we have finished the basis of animal classifications because we have learned that on what basis the animals has been classified into different different phylum. Okay. So just go through the book and find out the probable regions or the basis on which animals have been classified and kindly go through the new technologies and the terms that we are going to use when we go through the different phylums of animal classification. So this much for today. See you in next class. Thank you.